climate. So let's get stuck into it. Our first speaker tonight is David Holmgren. You'll know David as uh, he's an environmental designer and educator and writer, but you'll know him as one of the co-founders or co-originators of the permaculture concept. Um, he's, you know, done a lot of work in all sorts of permaculture uh, refinement and educating over the years but, uh, and, and teaching. He really sees permaculture as more of a philosophical mindset for a way of life, not just a way of gardening and growing. Uh, I hope I haven't taken the start of your speech there, Dave. No. And uh, <laughs> um, David was the one who was talking about the geopolitical blah blahs when I got in downstairs. So let's hope he's still got that fire in his belly. Your 10 minutes, David Holmgren, begins as soon as you get up to this microphone here. So join me in welcoming David. Thank you. It's great to, to be here for this debate, even though, of course, I, as an anarchist, question uh, this uh, simple dichotomy. Uh, the word collapse is very interesting because my work in framing the future as being one of energy descent specifically rejects the idea that civilization is actually going to fall off a cliff. But actually what is inevitable, no matter what any of us or anyone on the planet does individually or collectively, humanity is headed for a future where there's a continuous reduction in the energy and resources available to each generation for many, many generations into the future. And that is the framework within which permaculture 40 years ago reflecting the evidence of the limits to growth was framed. Now, of course, in a steady state world, that sweet scenario in the limits to growth that showed that if we did all those things or back then, maybe it was possible for the world to move out onto that plateau of some sort of steady state system. But it did involve this massive uh, transition, restructuring our financial system so they're no longer depended on perpetual growth. Uh, this huge conversion, dealing with the population issues, dealing with the inequity issues and the geopolitical crises which suck up most of the world's uh, resources. Resolving the war against nature, the war between the tribes and the war between the genders, all simultaneously, these ancient conflicts. That future, to me, over the decades, has seemed less and less likely. And that energy descent, in some form or another, is inevitable. Within that context, permaculture shifts from being some sort of uh, alternative lifestyle choice to being, at least in principle, if not in detail, the pattern of that energy descent world. And the great positive thing about that is that we've been through a long culture of continuous change, where every generation had to do something completely different from the previous one. And we take into that future that culture of change. It seems fairly evident to me that the underlying energetic and biological basis of life is the big driver in these futures and that that pulls away this idea that we have from uh, the Enlightenment and our culture of progress of human agency, that we are the masters of our own destiny. Of course, this can be critiqued as a biological determinism and Permaculture does have that other side of the focus on, yes, what we can do in ourselves is the great option we have. When I met Bill Mollison in 1974, I was walking away from the radical political activism which I'd grown up in, of trying to stop the world we didn't want, to we're just going to go out and create the world we do want. OK, I was 19, I was not interested in all of those uh, arguments about the structural inequities of the world and limitations. No, we're just going to go and do it. I met Mollison, who had actually come to the same point after five years of intensive environmental activism. And permaculture has always been about that, that we'll just create the world we do want 
for ourselves if for no one else. Of course, to the politicos, this is sort of abandoning the really important issues of society. Uh, and it's not doing anything that actually will change anything. I believe that the way the billion or so middle class people live and what they choose is the biggest leverage point that exists in the world. And that it is possible for relatively small numbers of that billion or so middle class people to actually have an influence on the system by what they choose to do. So by building that resilience, we're engaged in an enlightened self-interest. We then provide a model, many, many different models, because it looks different in every situation. Out of those models, other people have the capacity to copy that. They may, they may not. But at least they can do it without the permission of government, without the permission of the banks and the corporations, because we are mostly talking about small-scale change in our own lives. And then as that builds some sort of constituency, it may not be very big, but it has that enormous advantage that it works as a systemic strike against the system which is destroying the planet. Because when we grow our own food and disintermediate that massive chain from the large commercial growers to uh, the supermarket, we are actually taking money out of the centres of power and relocating it uh, down into building that resilience. When we support other uh, local uh, small business, when we do things for ourselves and restart the household and community economies, the non-monetary economies, which have always been the basis of every society, whereas the monetary economy has been the icing on the cake. When we rebuild that, we actually gain political strength. Rather than just shouting louder for those at the top to pull the levers of power in some completely different way to hopefully produce some different outcome to what they have been producing. If we are completely dependent virtually for the air we breathe on this massive centralised complex system, then we have actually no political power. When we come from a position of some degree of autonomy, we have much greater power. Now, whether that's enough to re-engage with a system that appears to be sending us straight over the cliff against all the scientific evidence remains to be seen. Maybe it doesn't, but I think it has a lot better chance of trying, than trying to build a majority movement shouting for less. I don't think that has any possibility of success. So the self-reliance strategy may also, I've suggested, act as a systemic strike on the system. And only because that system is so ridiculously vulnerable, not primarily right now because of peak oil and climate change, the, the two big long-term drivers, but because of the bubble economics, where it requires constant growth to push the debt tsunami ahead of us before it completely swamps us. It appears that debt tsunami is about to swamp us in some way or another. It was a few years ago. The problem hasn't gone away. So the system is right now in the process of unravelling. That is our greatest chance of actually being saved from the climate cooker. Because it is now very late in the piece. The idea that we are going to all get together and get some global agreement and then those global agreements actually lead to action which doesn't lead to the Jevons paradox of the activity just being recycled back into all the same problems seems highly unlikely. So the advice is to build your own self-reliance 
for enlightened self-interest. And then maybe others might copy that. And then maybe that might build a constituency that could actually leverage change. And maybe it might contribute to an actual collapse of the global financial system. And that may be the only thing that saves us from the climate cooker. It's never been my motivation that we need to smash that system. In fact, I'm appealing to alienated uh, activists who are seeing the hopelessness of the situation moving off into two different directions. One is, please give us a command economy and save us from this terrible future, because that's one of the solutions that's shaping up. And the other, of course, is the Unibomber solution. We must somehow uh, smash the system with violence, and it's obvious where that leads. So come over and join us at the cool resilience <laughs> end of the spectrum where we're having more fun anyway, <laughs> and maybe it might uh, save us from the climate cooker. Who knows? Trust a bloody anarchist to put a third option on the table in the first talk of the night. But I cannot tell you how impressed I am that you finished with six seconds to spare. Another, <laughs> another clap for that. So.